As psychologists, how can we measure stereotypes? In this day and age, it can be difficult to do so by simply asking people explicitly. Most people downplay their biases because they realize those biases aren't socially acceptable. We call this tendency social desirability because people's responses are socially desirable, even if they're not totally accurate. In this video, then, we'll explore several examples of how psychological scientists have circumvented this problem by using implicit measures of bias in addition to explicit ones. We'll specifically discuss implicit stereotypes about race, but keep these methods in mind because we'll use them again as we learn about other dimensions of diversity in future videos. But before we get to all of that, I want to start by answering this sort of philosophical question you've been staring at here. Are we really that different? Well, research shows that no genetic variations can be used to distinguish, for example, white people from black people or Asian people from Hispanic people. And I think that's a really telling difference. Now, differences between groups are real, of course, but people expect and perceive enormous differences, much bigger differences than there actually are, between people based on race, ethnicity, and so on. And this is part of what we're going to try to understand in these videos. As we progress, it'll also be important to try to assess which of these two constructs, cultural stereotypes or personal social beliefs, we're picking up on in the studies we discuss. The two constructs are different. For example, it's perfectly possible to be aware of a cultural stereotype, but not to hold that social belief personally. But again, they can be difficult to dissociate. So as we discuss each study today, decide whether you think we're assessing cultural stereotypes or personal social beliefs and think through why that distinction might matter. Okay, let's dive into a few studies. In a classic study, white participants' racial stereotypes were primed by using a white or black word on a computer flashed very briefly for about two tenths of a second. Not enough time for participants to consciously recognize the word, but enough time to influence their responses as we'll see. The results showed that the white prime facilitated participants' recognition of positive, for example, ambitious, compared with negative, for example, selfish, white stereotypical words. The black prime, however, did the opposite. The black prime facilitated participants' recognition of negative, like lazy, compared to positive, like musical, black stereotypical words. The magnitude of this implicit prejudice effect correlated reliably with participant scores on explicit racial attitude measures as well, indicating that people's spontaneous stereotypic associations are consistent with their more controlled, explicit responses. So this is obviously disheartening. In another study, researchers measured their mostly white participants' automatic associations between the colors white and black, and words representing immorality, such as greed, and morality, such as honesty. The results showed that participants named colors faster when the associations were consistent with people's stereotypes. For example, white paired with moral words and black paired with immoral words. And they were much slower when those uh, were inconsistent. For example, black paired with moral and white paired with immoral. And in a follow-up study, they also found that priming immorality by having participants hand copy an unethical statement speeded up the identification of words in the black font. Finally, in another study, white participants viewed racially ambiguous faces, as well as white and black faces, but we're not going to talk about that here, that displayed either angry, neutral, or happy emotions. And participants were asked to identify the race, as well as a couple other things, like the emotion and the emotional intensity of the display. The results revealed that participants who were high in implicit prejudice, as determined by an implicit association test that was completed after this task, reported significantly more of the racially ambiguous angry faces as black compared to participants who were low in implicit prejudice. Happy faces, in contrast, were significantly more likely to be labeled white, especially for those participants high in implicit prejudice. Okay, now I just mentioned the implicit association test, which is commonly abbreviated as the IAT. Let's talk more about what that test actually is. The IAT is a computer-based task designed to test participants' stereotypes or associations between categories such as social groups. Let me describe how the IAT works by telling you about an IAT that I designed. Uh, and I commonly use it in my research. Now, I'm not going to tell you about the results of this IET quite yet. We'll talk more about that when we get to sexism. The important part here is just that you start to get a gist for how the IET as a method works. 
Now here you can see two sample trials from my IAT. Subjects on these trials would sort the man into his appropriate category on the left by pressing E on the keyboard, and they would sort the woman here to the right by pressing I on the keyboard. And at the same time, words from a genius category and words from some control category, in this case creative, just some comparison, can also pop up. Participants are required to sort the items from all four categories uh, simultaneously. Now at this point, it's important to distinguish between congruent trials in which the categories that are paired together here on the same side of the screen are congruent with the association that we predict people have. So here, male plus genius. This is an IET basically trying to tap into biases regarding intelligence and gender. And we can sort of contrast that with incongruent trials in which the categories paired together are incongruent with the association that we predict people have. So female plus genius. I'll also note that a switch happens halfway through the test. So participants do see both types of trials in the same session. Now this distinction between congruent and incongruent trials is important for the logic of the IAT, which goes something like this. If participants find it easier to respond to those congruent trials when pairing men and brilliant, or male plus genius, as I've called it so far, and so it takes less time on those trials, and they make fewer mistakes on those trials, compared to those incongruent trials when they're pairing women and brilliant, or female plus genius, this would indicate that participants associate men with this trait, brilliance genius. Now the same logic holds for any IAT, although the specific categories used will change. You can apply the same structure to investigate associations related to race, political preferences, and really any other social category imaginable. So it's a really flexible tool. Now let me take you through a quick whirlwind tour of just a few IIT studies related to race, summarized across many studies and hundreds of thousands of participants. Let's start with the first example here. What you're seeing here is the four categories that participants had to sort in this IAT. African American versus European American, these are the target concepts, and good versus bad, these are the attribute concepts, basically trying to assess what the preference is, which group is more likely to be associated with good and which is more likely to be associated with bad. Here's the sample size for this study, n refers to the sample size, notice how large it is, we're talking about over 700,000 participants here. And finally, here are all of the results. Several numbers here, M refers to the mean, SD in parentheses refers to the standard deviation or the variability, we're not gonna talk too much about that. And then the effect size here, which I've labeled for you, small, medium, or large. A mean above zero, so a positive mean, indicates a bias against black people in this case, whereas a negative mean would indicate the opposite, a bias against white people. Here, because the mean is positive, it's 0.37, this means that participants showed an implicit preference for white people compared to black people, and this was a large effect, 0.86. This is a very large effect. Another IET demonstrated that participants had a preference for light skin compared to dark skin, and this was also a large effect. And similarly, another IET uh, demonstrated that the preference for white over black held for child targets rather than adult. Uh, targets, excuse me. So on the IAT, participants in this IAT were sorting pictures of children, white and black children, rather than of adults. People are also more likely to associate weapons with black people and harmless objects with white people than the other way around, which I think is particularly important for discussions going on uh, these days about police uh, brutality and violence and so on. Now what about other racial groups? This IET showed that participants uh, prefer the category other people over the category Arab Muslims. This was a medium-sized effect, but certainly not an insignificant one. Even small effects can have really big uh, practical effects in our society, but statistically they're small. This is a medium effect, but it still can have huge impacts. And people are also more likely to associate American with white Americans and foreign with Native Americans, even though both are literally American and it's in their name. And we see the same effect in favor of European Americans over Asian Americans as American, even though both are again American. 